All right, welcome to the uh, Friday q and I'm Mike Winger, a pastor in Southern California, trying to answer your questions biblically. The goal here is to think biblically about everything, which doesn't mean that I successfully do that. I make mistakes, but I'm going to try to be there along with you on the journey to learning how to do that better and better. If you're watching the live chat, you know we are getting a ton of messages that are flooding in right now. That's because at the beginning of these uh, live YouTube Q&As, we take a ton of questions and I gather ultimately 20 questions and then answer them all to the best of my ability. And sometimes that just means I say, I, I really don't know what the answer is to that question. And um, I uh, just move on. But we're going to do our best here. The first question today comes from Nicole Seekins, who says, "My uh, question one, my 17 year old son is into theology. Do you have any theology books you'd recommend for teens slash college students that aren't weighty reads, but offer good biblical answers to Christian questions, something that will interest a teenager without getting lost into a huge textbook? Thank you for all you do. Um, so here's my answer for three apologetics books, and, and this is what helps. See, making book recommendations is really hard um, for a number of reasons, why I normally don't make very many recommendations. Uh, you don't agree with everything in the book and people, they, they just inevitably think I do. Okay. Just cause I'm recommending a book doesn't mean everything I think is right. If I, if I have that requirement to have to agree with everything in the book, the only book I can recommend is the Bible, right? But if you're going to go outside that, you're going to have secondary type books and that's a problem. Also, people are in different life situations. So this really helps, Nicole. You've given me a very specific thing. A 17-year-old who is, you know, maybe intimidated by a real weighty read. I'm not going to recommend William Lane Craig's, um, on guard. I think that's a little bit too weighty for him it, from your description. So what I will recommend is a couple other books. I have three in mind. I'll give you four actually, but here there's three in mind. One of them is the book right there, Cold Case Christianity, although I grabbed the wrong picture of it. I have it on Kindle, but this is the participant's guide, but the book is called Cold Case Christianity. And what's ni nice about this book, and I'm not making anything off of these things, just go find it on Amazon or whatever. Um, so you know these are genuine recommendations. The nice thing about this book is that it's um, J. Warner Wallace was a uh, detective who did a, a cold case detective who did a, basically a cold case investigation of Christianity to try to piece together um, the clues. And he ended up becoming a Christian ultimately because of this investigation. And he wrote a book walking through those things. The reason why this book's great for someone who you're describing, your 17-year-old son, each chapter opens with a detective story. And then that very interesting detective story ties in with the apologetic stuff that you're learning in that chapter. So I think this is the kind of thing that glues people who are interested in like crime shows and detective things and CSI, that kind of stuff. So there's, there's an example of one book that you could do. Another one is Tactics by Greg Kokel. This book does not give you the reasons for Christianity so much as the tactics on how to have conversations about Christianity with friends, neighbors, coworkers, all this kind of stuff, um, schoolmates. So um, this will change the way you have conversations in some very healthy ways. And so Tactics is really good for that. It's just newly updated, recently redone and changed. And then if you want one more weighty option, I'm gonna say um, the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which uh, just recently a new version of this came out. And this is um, Josh McDowell originally did it. And then his son, Sean McDowell, partnered with him to like revamp the book, tweak things, correct things whenever possible and change things around. This is this is weighty. This is like for those who want to go deep on very specific issues. And so what you can do is get a sample of this, you know, from online, get like a few pages and look through the table of contents to see if it's the kind of thing you think you or your son or someone else would be interested in. So there's three books I recommend for like the wannabe. I want to get into apologetics, but I don't want it to be too heavy for me. There's plenty of other books out there. The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel is the first one I read that really, really impacted my life. Um, and uh, I, I literally read it because I had no money. And someone was had a there was a book table that was giving away books for free. And I picked up The Case for Christ because I was struggling with apologetic stuff at the time. And that made a big difference in my life. So there's another option that you might consider. Um, a lot of people recommend that book. So we'll go to question number two. And this one comes from Patrick Schmidt, who says, does God still bless us in material ways? Or was that just for the old covenant? And now he solely blesses us in spiritual ways. Um, I think that what we should do is understand that um, God's blessing of people was never only in the old covenant. It's just that his blessings came with specific kinds of promises in the old covenant. So you can still have blessings of God outside that covenant, as not part of the old covenant, but not according to the covenant. 
right? So he made a, a deal with Israel. Hey, if you, if you, if you follow me, if you seek me, if you honor me nationally, I will bless you nationally. I will give you these kinds of benefits. You will, you will have um, food and you will have health and you will have protection from your enemies. And that's something he promised to Israel under this old covenant. And then Israel fails. And here's the, here's the big, the big, like salvation picture God's drawing, I think for us in the old Testament is that Israel keeps failing to obey the covenant. So then curses keep coming upon them. You know, when they go back and forth in the book of Judges, it's like seven cycles of, you know, failure coming back to God, he delivers them. Then they fail, they sin, they get cursed. Um, this is going on over and over. So what I'm going to suggest is as a Christian, we're not, we're not under those same, that same covenant. We're under the new covenant in Christ. And the new covenant does, like you suggest, it, it Patrick, it focuses on spiritual things, eternal things. But there's also physical blessings coming in the future. It's just a timing issue. See, it's not like, will I be blessed physically? It's more like, when am I guaranteed that blessing? In the new resurrection, in the new creation, we're going to have abundant physical enjoyments and blessings and, and wealth and riches and all this other thing. So th this is what we read in Revelation. Um, our treasures are in heaven, as Jesus said. So we just change where the blessings are coming, not whether they're coming. But that doesn't mean God won't bless you materially. Um, biblically, outs, whether you're in the covenant or not, whether you're part of that Old Testament covenant, the Mosaic covenant, God, every blessing that man receives is seen as a blessing from God. Every time you, you, you drink something tasty and you eat something yummy and you, get, you have health and every time you stand up and your arms work and your legs work and your lungs work and your brain works, like all of these are blessings from God. So in a sense, I want to say everyone is being abundantly blessed. All the time. We, we have a, a, there's a commonly misunderstood verse, I'll, I'll quote, that relates to this. And it's, it's where Jesus says that um, uh, God makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And this passage, um, let's go there, Matthew 5.45, and I'll put it on screen for you. Often misunderstood. So you're to, you're to bless those who hurt you, bless those who persecute you and all this. And one of the reasons is because God makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. We often misunderstand this verse because we think sun rising is good, rain falling is bad. Um, but that's, it doesn't say um, tsunami or something bad like that. Sun and rain are essential things for people to live. Like you can't survive without these in any community without sun and rain. And in a farming community, which which is what they were, uh, an agrarian society largely, they they would see sun and rain as blessings from God. And the point is God is blessing everyone all the time. We have the problem of taking our blessings for granted. So you are promised um, tribulation in this life as a Christian. You are not promised the kinds of blessings that came to Israel, but you are being blessed even right now. Even just you being able to type, you having the, the money to afford a computer or a phone, this is a blessing from God. That God should get all the credit. We should be very grateful people. But we are ready to endure suffering because our ultimate treasure and the promised blessing that's coming is in heaven and it is in the new creation. And that is where we put all of our hope. So I, I hope that helps. Um, when you, what you see all the time with like prosperity preachers and TV money grubbing people, <laughs> not, not that everybody on TV is money grubbing, but you know the ones I'm talking about. What we see all the time with those people is they'll quote promises to Israel and how they were connected to things like Israel tithing. And then they'll suggest that if you tithe, God will bless you financially. But that is a confusion of covenants, like you suggest. So yes, God can bless you, but you can't claim promises to Israel, <laughs> ignore the curses, and then, you know, prop up your TV uh, ev evangelism ministry. Yeah. All right. Jack O'Connell says, how does God communicate to us outside of the Bible? Does he speak through mediums like words, numbers, and coincidences? Um, let me just say there's a difference between what, what God normally does and what God can do. Okay. So can God speak through a medium? He could. In fact, there's an example in scripture of this, and it may make you feel uncomfortable, but just hear me out. Hear me out. I'm not endorsing mediums. That's evil. And we need to not do that. But can God use it? He can, if he wants to. So King Saul, when, um, when, uh, Samuel had died, and he was the prophet who Saul had access to, and he no longer was hearing from God. He goes to a medium and asks to contact Samuel. And the medium is, has success. Now, the medium seems shocked and surprised. So I think that this was, God was like, um, 
using this to rebuke him. But did God use the medium to speak to, to Saul? Yes, yes. And the message was, you're going to die. Right? So this is like not a, not a good thing. He never should have done it. It was all bad. It's not approved of. So God can use it. Can he use things like words or numbers? Like you keep hearing a word and you're like, maybe God's showing me something. Or you see a number multiple places and you think, I think God's showing me something. I think God can do that. Is it normal? I don't think so. It seems to me that we don't have any examples in scripture that this kind of thing is normal. And even though God can use a medium to speak to Saul, guess what? Saul is rebuked and reprimanded for going to the medium. And the message is ultimately, it was his final act of rebellion. And now he's going to be, uh, he's going to die. So that obviously doesn't endorse that. Um, God's ex expressly against those sorts of things. One of the problems with um, thinking too, leaning too heavily on coincidences and numbers is that we start thinking that figuring out what God is saying is a calculation. And, and you can see how this could be a problem. Um, if God speaks to me, I need to know it was God. I, I don't want to think maybe the Lord might be saying this. I saw the number three and then I saw the three again over here and I saw three and I've just seen three everywhere. And then um, this third job offer, I'm going to say yes to, right? Like, do you know that? Or are you just guessing at God's will because of random cryptic numbers? We have the spirit within us. And so I would think the typical way in which God would speak to you if you had an individual message is what we see in scripture, standard, because I believe in the gifts, right? So someone offering you a prophetic word, someone coming to you and giving you a word of wisdom that you, in, in your spirit, you, you go, I, I really do believe this is from God. It's not just me calculating and figuring things out right? It, it's, it's a clear, this is from the Lord. And maybe you talk to some leaders in your life and they, they confirm, yeah, we believe that God is leading us. That's a lot more clarity and security than coincidences. Coincidences, sometimes what happens is, you know, like we, we just, I just got a new car. Well, used car. Okay. Just got a, a new used car. And, um, and I was looking at cars and you start to notice the same cars everywhere, all over the place. Now you could think that's just a coincidence that maybe God is using in your life, but the truth is I'm looking for them. That's why I'm seeing them everywhere. Normally I drive by cars. I don't notice them. I don't pay much attention, but I'm noticing these cars because they're the kind of cars I'm, I might get. Now I shouldn't you know, fall into the mistake of thinking I'm reading God's will into super vague things. God can speak to you as clearly as he wants. So I wouldn't lean on those things. They would be the exception, not the rule, but I wouldn't rule them out entirely. So, um, Number four, all star, ser wait, all stars are dead. <laughs> okay. All the stars are dead says, how is separation from all bishops okay when ECFs, especially Cyprian and Ignatius taught the separation from your bishop can call into question your salvation? Cyprian, Epistle 26, Ignatius, uh, Phil the letter to Philadelphia. Okay. So here's um, uh, a few questions. First off, I, I'd have to read Cyprian and Ignatius and carefully work through this. I don't have the answer. all, So I'm going to deal with a little bit more broadly the idea that separation from your bishops means that you are called, your salvation is called into question. And this has to do with, um, I think, a view of the church that is unbiblical. If we see the church not as whoever believes in Jesus wherever they are, but if we see the church as something different, as an organizational structure that's kind of like from the top down. And if we see the church, um, then you have to be part of the organization officially, right, in order to be saved. Um, and if we see this, this situation as also the church as like a mediator of grace, that grace is almost like a substance. This, this is in, in Roman Catholic theology is my understanding of it, is that grace is viewed almost as though it's a substance as opposed to like sort of a status. Like you have, you have grace. Okay, so you're forgiven. Someone says, I forgive you. I, I didn't actually impart a substance to you, right? But there's something that um, that some scholars call the nature grace interdependence. And in Roman Catholicism, it's a big deal that you, you're the grace and, and this and perhaps in, in Orthodox as well, which I haven't spent as much time on. Um, the idea is that, that there's things in nature that communicate or bring grace to you as opposed to it just being something that is given by God who just says, I forgive you. Now, if you think that, then your involvement in an organizational church, your connection under a bishop could be something important because it's mediating grace to you so that you can stay saved, um, so you can maintain or even gain salvation. And that that is, I think, an unbiblical view. And I think we have some examples of this because we have people just getting saved without connection 
to even the apostles. So in, in Acts chapter 10, we have Cornelius and his crowd. And Peter seems inclined to not even go talk to them because they're Gentiles. And he has a vision from God to go and speak with them. So he goes to see Cornelius. And as he's just telling them the gospel, because he feels like he has to, the Holy Spirit descends upon them and they are saved. And then, and they're not officially part of the new church, right? Like P Peter's not, hasn't endorsed them in that sense. But he sees what God is doing, and then he says, I guess we shouldn't forbid them being baptized and this kind of official involvement in our, in our fellowship because they're already saved. Do you see how sometimes the, the Holy Spirit can work outside of the structures of our visible church and will just save people? I think that this is totally fine. I don't see any biblical reason to avoid that. Now, you could be rejecting a bishop or an elder. By the way, elder and bishop biblically are the same thing. There is no difference in some structures. An elder and a bishop are very different kinds of things, but biblically they're used as synonyms in the, in the New Testament. But, but let's say that you reject your elders. You're separated from your church leadership. But what if it's because your church leadership is oppressive and um, unbiblical and ungodly? I mean, if that's the case... Are we going to now question your salvation because you were driven out by ungodly people? Even some of the church fathers that you might look at, right? The ECFs, these early church fathers, some of the people you might look at, some of them had trouble, were chased out of their own their own uh, bishopric, right? They were, they were chased out of their own leadership. They were defrocked and stuff. And then time went by and they were seen as being godly and they were standing for right and they were just being chased out by others. So here's what I'm suggesting. Being part of the church is about your personal relationship with Christ. And you are part of the church if you have a relationship with Jesus. Now, because you have a relationship with him, you are supposed to be, have healthy, godly relations with other Christians. But my relationship with Jesus doesn't depend on the leadership of my local church or some approved societal extra-biblical structure of bishops being above others and all this other weird stuff. It just doesn't depend on any of that stuff. And part of this might be seeing um, the biblical teaching of what's called the priesthood of all believers, that every Christian believer is, is a priest. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that we're all to go and in, engage in the activities of priests? No, 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 because there were no New Testament activities of priests. That came, you know, far later in church history. What it means, see, the priest is the mediator between you and God. But we're told in scripture that Jesus is my mediator. And I'm a priest, which means I have no other mediator. You and God, that's it. There's the relationship. Now, because of you and God, you are part of the church, whether your local visible church recognizes you or not, whether your local elders or bishops or whoever acknowledges you or not, um, because they're not the ones that make you Christian. Faith in Christ, that's what does the job. So there, there's my response to that. I, I'd have to look up the quotes to respond in more detail to those guys um, if they thought that you had to be part of the, um, the the submission to the local bishop, um, I would think they were just wrong. But I also recognize what they were dealing with in, in we're talking second century, right? What they're dealing with in this time is stuff like um, false gospels. And they felt like local churches saying, hey, we have the apostolic tradition and we can tell you the real true gospel. And if you don't agree, then you're out. Then that's actually a gospel issue, not a bishop issue. And over time, they slowly seem to start to confuse the difference. It's not about... It, now it's about the authority of the local bishop and not the actual authentic gospel itself. That's my short answer. All right, moving on. Number five, Evan Birkby says, I love your thinking, Mike. Do you have any idea why Revelation 7.14 in the New Living Translation says, these are the ones who died, but other translations say they came out of the Great Tribulation? Um, we'll look at the passage together. Um, let's look at it first in New Living Translation. Let me just make sure that that's big enough on your screen. And we'll consider it together. So this is um, Revelation 7.14. And so the New Living Translation, which you guys should know, in case anybody out there doesn't know, is that this is a, um, a more flexible translation. Um, that they work hard to make it very accessible. But they're going to be feeling more freedom to make more interpretive choices than other translations would that might be more like strictly word for word. And so that, that's good and bad. It makes things easier to understand, but it also puts, a, puts more trust in the mediator, the translation, of, under, of, of you know, making sure they're interpreting things right. Um, sometimes there's things that are ambiguous, that you're like not sure what, which way it should be translated. And 
the translators will keep that ambiguity in the text. They'll, you'll be like, I don't know what it means, but that's because they didn't know what it meant, right? Other times they'll say, well, let's make a decision for the interpretation of what that means and we'll put it in the text. So there's some degree of interpretation in all translation, but more so in the New Living. That being said, I generally like the New Living translation. Um, so it says here, um, yeah, these are the ones who died in the Great Tribulation. Um, now, what you had for the New Living Translation in your question, it says these are the ones who died, but the translation says they just came out of the Great Tribulation. Now, there are asterisks here. Um, and the asterisks, which aren't, they don't show up on your screen, but it just says who came out of, who came out of in asterisks. So this is, what's clear is that this is the New Living Translation offering an interpretation of the Greek phrase, who came out of. In the New Living Translation, in the author's or the translator's opinion, who came out of means they died, right? So they're they're gonna um, they're gonna say that came out of means died. The ESV. Let's go to the ESV and the same passage, Revelation seven fourteen. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, and um, uh, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So yeah, it's just an interpretive choice. The, the NLT thinks the way they came out is they died and they're going to probably support that through other uses of the term and of the idea in Revelation about how those, the one who endures to the end and they're going to, they're going to have their, their heads cut off and things like this, that they're the ones who did not give up their faith and they were willing to die for it. So maybe that's what they mean by they came out of the great tribulation is that they died. So it's an interpretive choice being added there. Um, not in the Greek, but in the, implications of what is written there. Number six, Austin Hallman says, how do I start conversations about Jesus with strangers slash acquaintances? Um, Austin, this is one of the hardest things <laughs> for me too. Um, I'm not really confrontational <laughs> by nature. Um, and, uh, and so um, I think one of the best way, ways to do it is to ask questions. So if you walk up to someone and you're like, hey, I want to tell you about something, Compared to walking up to someone and asking them questions, I think that it's just a much better tactic or strategy for how to approach them. So you could ask them a question. Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think about that? Um, sometimes you start with something, if you have a few minutes with somebody, hey, hey, what do you, what do, you do for a living? You know, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do this. And then you start segueing into questions about Jesus. Sometimes you just jump straight in. Yeah, somebody, so what do you think happens when we die? <laughs> <laughs> and then you just you but the nice thing about asking them a few questions is you earn some credibility because you're willing to listen to them and, and really listen, really care about what they say. And you 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 earn some credibility with them, some sort of like conversational currency. Right? I ask you questions, you share your thoughts. I'm not just pushing back, I'm just listening, I'm gathering, I'm thinking. And then when you share your thoughts on things, you're able to hopefully um, give some insights that now respond, not only in general to give the gospel, but respond to the specific issues and questions that person has. And again, a book I recommended earlier, which I'm making nothing for this, right? This is just because I think it's a really useful tool for you. Tactics by Greg Kokel. This is all about having conversations, right? Sean McDowell says, tactics will revolutionize your conversations with non-Christians, right? So if it doesn't work, you call Sean McDowell and let him know that he lied. Big liar. All right, number seven, Adam Habaker. Um, Adam Habaker says, Hey, Pastor Mike, do the two different stances on the extent of the atonement, unlimited and definite, ultimately represent two different gospels? This is a fear of mine. Okay, let me just bring anybody up to speed if they're not where Adam's at with this question. So um, the extent of the atonement is a fancy way of saying like, who did Jesus die for? Who did Jesus die for? And um, the, my phone's blowing up. All right, all right. I'll answer your sales call later. The, um, uh, the, the answers that people would give is, hey, he dies for the whole world, but only people who believe are actually receiving the benefits of that salvation. That, that's my view. And I've, I've done several videos talking about this. And that would be called like um, unlimited or, or, or universal the extent of the atonement, it, it extends it, it, right? But the application is limited to those who believe. Then there's another understanding of who Jesus died for that's called definite atonement or limited atonement. Usually it's called limited atonement uh, uh, popularly because it's part of Calvinism and Calvinism uses the TULIP acronym, T-U-L-I-P and the L is limited atonement. 
Anyway, the idea here is that Jesus only ultimately died for those who would believe. So he doesn't die for the whole world in the sense of every human that's ever existed or will exist, but he dies only for the ones who will believe. And your question is, okay, does this represent two different gospels? And I'm going to suggest the answer's no, in my opinion. Um, because while I care about this issue, and I think the scripture is clear on this issue, so I definitely disagree with limited atonement. And of all of the points of Calvinism, this is the most disputed. Um, like if you talked, to, if you polled Calvinists, more Calvinists disagree with the L part of, of Calvinism, the limited atonement part, than anything else, right? So this isn't even universally held in Calvinism, although I think it's consistent with Calvinism, <laughs> but that's my, my view. Um, anyhow, the, the reason why I'd say this isn't a fundamentally false gospel is because I have a pretty simplistic understanding of the gospel, and that is that if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved, right? So that the extent of the atonement is actually not an essential part of the gospel, it's the application of the atonement upon all those who believe. That's the part that is um, essential. And this part, both sides agree on. So this to me is a secondary issue. This is a, an issue believers can can openly disagree on. And this is where, um, for me, I look at denominations and I look at different groups, but I don't see as much division as others see because I see a lot of secondary issues. And I go, hey, I disagree with you there, but you're my brother and I can hold hands with you. I disagree with you there, my sister, and I can hold hands with you. And we can gather together with all of our cat hair and um, we can hold hands. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, I disagree with the Calvinist on this. Do not think it's a gospel issue. I don't know a good reason to think it is a gospel issue. I'd have to hear it. And I'm very slow to call something a gospel issue because to me, gospel issue means you're wrong on this. You're wrong about heaven and hell. You're wrong about salvation. Like you are, you're not saved because of this issue. So I don't call it a gospel issue. Does it connect to the gospel in a secondary sense? Yes. Yes. But when I use the term gospel issue, I mean, you better get this right <laughs> or you're not saved. This is my cat. This is Moxie. Oh yeah. There's a fuzzy cat. Are you ready for your close-up? Anyway, next question. <laughs> we'll go to number eight. Um, Nikki Steph says, I talk to God. I talk to God in my head and pray during the day, but my thoughts drift sometimes. I realize I never said amen. I know that he's listening, but if it's not formatted like a prayer, does it not count? And Nikki, I want to say... Um, yeah, you're, you're fine. <laughs> you're totally fine. There isn't even a rule in the Bible that every prayer has to end with amen. Like, where's that a rule? I say amen all the time in my prayers. I think it's nice. Do I always say amen when I'm praying? No, just like you, even earlier today, right before the stream, I was praying about the stream and the questions and asking God for wisdom as I try to give you guys hopefully helpful answers and not overstep my own knowledge on things, um, which is a real danger, of course. Um, I didn't say amen. But remember this, prayer is not a formula. Prayer is a, an actual discussion with the living God. And so if imagine if God's there in the room with you because he's actually even closer than that. And you, you just talk to him. Me and my wife are like this, right? We, we don't have full conversations during the day. A lot of the time it's like I say something, she says something, and we're just we're walking away and walking around because we're just around each other all the time. That's Nothing's wrong with that. That's part of, I think, a healthy relationship <laughs> when you're very close. You don't need to have as official of, of, of a, um, oh, a beginning and ending, in a sense. So all, all prayer in that sense is acceptable to God. I don't think there's any need for it. And you can, you can actually find probably multiple examples of prayers in the Bible that don't end with amen. Right? They just don't. And I think that you, uh, you are, you're, in, you're in a good place. Keep praying. Keep talking to the Lord. And uh, sometimes your, your, your thoughts get distracted and that's part of our human condition. But don't don't quit praying. Number nine, Folky has a question. How do I go about searching the scriptures to help me find a solution or to come to a decision in an area of my life? Well, Folky, what I'm going to suggest is a bunch of things real quick. Here's my, here's my speedy rundown to several issues that may or may not relate to you personally. So just, just know I'm just throwing out advice and you can consider what applies to your situation. Um... One, I don't usually go to the Bible to find out specifically what I'm supposed to do with, with very specific scenarios in life. Like, I just got a car. What car should I buy? I, I, I don't, I don't, this is the first time I've got a car since like 2009, I think. And um, uh, it was time. <laughs> so, so I don't go to the Bible to look at what kind of car I should get. 
Instead, I look for biblical principles to help guide me in making good choices. So for instance, guard your heart against covetousness. That's a biblical principle. So as I'm looking for a car, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that my heart can run away in wanting something better and bigger and nicer and fancier. I'm also aware that I'm supposed to be a good steward. I'm supposed to handle money responsibly, so I need to look at our budget and consider if what we can afford and can't afford. I'm also aware that Proverbs just teaches us to be walking in wisdom. I should not buy a car that's just going to break down. I shouldn't buy a car that's going to be some problems later on or doesn't fit our life situation. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm looking for principles in Scripture that will help me make good decisions moving forward. So that helps me and guides me. That's what I would encourage you to look for is principles, not clear direction about specific choices. Not that God won't ever give you that. But here's the problem if God always gives me that. And this is just my personal understanding. Because I used to want God to guide every choice. Because I thought if God would guide every choice, then every choice is perfect. And I'm, I mean, now I'm, I know I'm in the right path because God told me to do this. And maybe that means I'll have more success in those things. But what kind of a wisdomless and nervous person would I become if I never learned to make choices based on principles? I'll never be wise because I'll never be deciding. I mean, even with marriage, you pray about who to marry. God may or may not tell you that person. But even if he doesn't say that's the girl or that's the guy, you should be able to make wise choices to discern character and relationship and direction and all these different things, you know, that are important. Are they a believer? Are we like-minded? Are we equally yoked? These kinds of questions. That is, in a sense, makes you a stronger person and a more full person than getting clear answers. Do this, do that. So if you're looking for wisdom, read Proverbs. If you're looking to watch out for the pulling of the flesh, read what Galatians says about the works of the flesh are these and make sure, hey, am I decision or are, are these, you know, are these things guiding me, influencing me? Um, get counsel. Proverbs says there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. So get advice from a few people. Anytime you're making big life choices, get some advice from a few people. It will change your future. And I think then we become um, stronger, godlier people when we're not like, Every choice God has to tell me specifically what to do. Um, that's not a healthy way to be. Number 10, John S. Pryor, uh, oh, John, Josh S. says, prior to Pentecost, was anyone born of God slash born of the Spirit as the Spirit hadn't been given yet? Can this discredit regeneration preceding faith slash total inability? Thank you. Josh, I don't know that I know the right answer to this question. Um, you know, if, if, uh, I mean, Abraham was counted righteous, right? So there's something that happened with Abraham in Genesis. He's counted righteous. We have people prophesying and they're even filled with the spirit, but we don't have it being this sort of like universal experience that people are uh, able to do this sort of like in Pentecost where you have like tons of people doing it in the early church where it's happening in such a massive scale to show there's no separation between man and God now. Um, but yeah, th this is something I, in my own research, I'd like to dig into more. What is the relationship to the spirit and regeneration that Old Testament saints had uh, prior to the giving of the spirit. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm settled on that. Uh, Jesus talks about how the spirit is, 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 is with you, right? Um, there's the, the within and upon experience. I think a typical Pentecostal perspective would be that the, the, um, the upon experience Man, I'm just I'm just blanking on how to how to word this carefully, so I'm just going to not. But yeah, that's that's a great question, Josh. Um, one that I'd like to look into more, and I don't really know the answer. Now, you say, hey, let's let's theorize that those Old Testament saints hadn't experienced regeneration. Then you couldn't say regeneration precedes faith. I think that if I was a Calvinist, my response would be, well, I would just say it was a different it was a different brand of regeneration, right? They were regeneration, but it's just not the fullness of what comes later. I think that would be a potential rescue. At this point, I feel like we're, we might be trying to force some theology into some stuff that's not there. Um, yeah. Good question. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer, Josh. I apologize. My own limitations there. Number 11. Anonymous question here. It says, Hello, Pastor Mike. I heard that the historian's consensus for the patriarchs, the exodus, and the conquest of Canaan was that they didn't happen but were made up later. Any input on this? Um, so a consensus 
for historians usually represent, or for any field from, to my knowledge, I think represents 90% or more in agreement. And I don't know that, I don't think that's the case. I mean, if it is, it's just, I'm just not in that field. So I don't know, but whenever you hear claims like this, you guys, um, before you go to prove them wrong, ask whoever said it to prove it right. Right, because because this is what happens. To, often as Christians, you feel that you, you want to evangelize. You want to see people getting saved. And so then they tell you, oh, well, the, the Romans invented Christianity to control the people. None of it's true. And then you go, oh, gosh, I got to do a bunch of research. I have to prove that Rome didn't invent Christianity. Before you go and do that, you can use something from the book Tactics, which I apparently this entire stream is just an advertisement for t the book Tactics by Greg Kokel. Um, you can use a tactic from that Greg Kokel mentions where you say, how did you come to that conclusion? This is a great question to ask somebody, right? Well, I heard that historians, you know, someone says historians, they all agree. The consensus is the patriarchs, the exodus, and the conquest of Canaan didn't happen. Well, how did you come to that conclusion about historians? Do you know any of the reasons they think that? How many exactly think that? Do you have like a source for this claim? And then you find out a little bit more about how strong this claim really is. Um, one uh, guy on YouTube who offers evidence for, for various things like this, the Exodus and the Conquest in particular, I think, is David Falk. And he's got a YouTube channel you can check out. I'm not endorsing all his stuff. I don't even know his opinions on all these things. But I often see people just as a resource. Like, I know he's a resource you might consider. He's a Christian who offers information on this. David Falk, F-A-L-K. He's on YouTube. He's got free video content there you guys can check out. He talks about some of these things. And he gets into detail. Like, he's... Egyptologist and he gets into nitty gritty detail. So I, I recommend checking them out, but push back when people make these wild claims like Christmas is pagan. Oh, do you have any evidence for that? Because you don't. <laughs> All right. All right. Number 12, shaping disciples ministries asked the question. I was having doubts about the atonement and I was questioning if I really believed it. I had thoughts about me not believing it. Am I still saved if I confessed those and do believe? Um, Okay, so there's something, I, I've I've been through this, um, where you, at least, okay, in my, in my experience, it felt like this. This is very subjective, very much just my own life experience here, okay? Where, where in my own season of doubt about even the resurrection of Christ, like th there was a major season I went through that was many years ago, but I went through and it, it, it's what caused me to go deep into apologetics, right? Because I'm like, I want to make sure that I, this stuff's really true. And... Here's, here's a lesson I've learned. I'll give you the short version of the story. There's a difference between how you feel and what you choose to trust. And for me, there were times where I thought, I don't know what, I don't know what I feel like I believe. And if I was, and if I consulted my emotions, I didn't know what I believed. But when I consulted my decisions, I was choosing to trust. I think that faith is not just a feeling. It often comes with feelings, but sometimes feelings can fight against it. I think faith is a decision you make to trust. I think you choose to trust. And that there's times where you're in you're in a wild roller coaster and that feelings, the feelings are just going crazy, but your choice is to trust. And so I'm going to read your question again and try to answer it now. I, I was having doubts about the atonement and I was questioning if I really believed it. So I see you as introspecting. Am I really believing this or am I doubting it? I don't know what... But I believe doubt and faith can coexist when you choose faith over doubt. It's a choice. So you are believing it. That's a decision you make. Um, I had thoughts about me not believing. Right? You had thoughts about not believing. Totally understandable. Am I still saved if I confess those things and do believe? Yes. Absolutely. Um, let, let's go to... It's so beautiful that God saw fit to actually put a scripture uh, in the Bible to deal with this exact thing. And so it, it's, it's in the passage where, where, um, where the, let's, let's look at it together. Actually, Mark nine, put it on your screen. Um, okay. I'm going to back up a little bit, right? So there's, there's a, there's a young man, uh, a man who has a son, excuse me. Um, and let's read about his the, the whole experience of this guy because he goes through the same thing as you just on a very different issue. Um, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. Um, oh, well, they're arguing. Let's skip. Oh, yeah. Here's what they're arguing about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to, to him and greeted him. This is Jesus. They're greeting. And when he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? 
And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he had a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they were not able. So here's a problem. They're not able. And he answered them, Oh, faithless generation. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. The implication is the disciples themselves didn't have enough faith. Now, they didn't have enough faith here in the sense of doing this 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 prayer about this the miraculous moment, but this doesn't mean that they were rejecting Christ, right? They're they're struggling with something. And they brought this the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. The spirit's re- responding to Jesus's presence and asserting control. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, which which means it's one of those things that the guy doesn't really expect to go to get better. <laughs> uh, but he's hoping it will, but he doesn't expect it. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why he knew it was a spiritual thing and not just a physical ailment. Because it's not just random physical issues. It's ones that are particularly evil, right? Um Verse 23, and Jesus said to him, if you can, if you can, right? Because he asked Jesus, if you can do anything, please have compassion. Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And now the issue, just like you, the issue of belief is being confronted with this man. Jesus is right there. His, his own disciples just tried in the name, probably in the name of Jesus, to cast this thing out and nothing happened because there was some faith issue there. But the man experienced this, seeing the disciples fail to do this, to heal his boy. Then Jesus shows up. He's the guy leading them. And he says, all things are possible if you'll believe. But I can, you can feel the battle he's going through, right? Like He's got evidence against this, but he also has hope. Immediately, the father of the child cried out. And what he says is the most honest statement. I believe, help my unbelief. Unbelief and belief can coexist at the same time. When you say to yourself, my belief is what I'm choosing. My unbelief is what I'm feeling. I feel afflicted. I feel challenged with unbelief, but my choice is to still trust. And I will continue to trust in Christ and his truth and his goodness. Now, is that enough? If you are so conflicted that you have to say to God, I believe you, but help my unbelief because it's still there. And Jesus saw that the crowd coming together, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, You mutant deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And he cries out and then he falls down and he's, and they think he looks like he's dead, but no, no, he's, he's healed. He's at rest. He's finally relaxed after all that aggressive stuff that was done to him. And, um, and check this out. Here's the formula. Jesus says, Hey, I can heal him. If you believe the man says, well, here's, here's the best I can do. I believe you. Will you help my unbelief? I have unbelief coexisting here with my belief, but I'm choosing my faith. My, my will says I will choose faith. Jesus heals, which means that kind of belief is enough. Even if it's not fun, even if it doesn't feel great, it's enough to be accepted. Please remember that. And remember that when you guys are dealing with people who are struggling with doubt. Because it's a big deal. I've been there. And I'm not there anymore. <laughs> Thank God. But I've been there. Number 13, Grayson Arant says, someone told me Jesus was rich and that was how he was able to feed the 5,000 and their families. <laughs> I love this stuff. Um, I know that's wrong, but where do they find these theories and how do I help him see that it's not true? Well, you know, if you uh, read the book Tactics by Greg Kokel, um, you'll actually have some some thoughtful things to say there. But yeah, the, the same question comes up. How did you come to that conclusion? That's a fantastic way to, to, to put it for them because what it does is it forces them to make a case. See, you don't just say, can you prove it, right? It, can you prove it is a little bit more aggressive if you ask someone, how can you, how did you come to that conclusion? You're sort of just inviting them to explain to you their thought process that got them to believe that Jesus fed the 5,000 because he was rich, right? Then you can go to the passage that says that Jesus was, well, among other things, poor. He doesn't have a place to lay his head. We have other, because you can, because I want him to build a case so I can see it, but you can build a case for Jesus's poverty in a number of ways. He, the son of man has no place to lay his head. When he does go to, uh, when he leaves Nazareth and he stays somewhere in Capernaum, he doesn't even stay at his own house. He stays at Simon Peter's house, right? They, it's called his home in one text, but that's because he's staying there when he's in Capernaum. It's the home he's staying at there. Um, when, when Jesus, uh, when, when he's, offered 
uh, like brought when the gifts are brought, excuse me, I to rethink how I'm going to explain this. After Jesus's birth, he was brought to the temple and the offerings for a newborn son were given and his circumcision took place. The offerings that they give are turtle doves, which is to say that they're poor because God has these sort of tiered offerings. He's like, here's the offering for this. But if you're in poverty, you can just bring turtle doves because they're like the cheapest offering. So the these birds, I think they were turtle doves, the birds are offered to show that his family is poor. Right? His father's a carpenter. They, they live in Nazareth, which is a podunk town that is of, of no nothing impressive. There's zero reason to think Jesus was rich. And then you can add to this that in the feeding of the 5,000, it's clearly a miracle. So if, if like what we're suggesting here is that Jesus is like, you know, saw the crowd, he went and bought a bunch of food and gave it to them. But what was written was that he miraculously multiplied the, the fish and loaves. But it's clear in the passage, he doesn't even have food, right? It's, it's somebody else who provides it. And then he multiplies the boys fish and loaves. When uh, I can add more to this, when Jesus was traveling through his ministry, he doesn't even pay for his own his own way. He supported, according to Luke, financially from the from the donations of women who traveled and followed along nearby and with Jesus and his disciples, and they donated, they supported out of their wealth. It's like rich people don't live off charity, you know. But Jesus, he did, and so I, I think that there's anyway there's there's a, no, a number of them. You could also say when Jesus offered taxes, right? He they're, they say, hey, Jesus, you're going to pay taxes? And he tells Peter, go fishing, and the, there'll be a coin in the fish's mouth. By the way, there are fish in the in the Sea of Galilee um, that do actually have, they harbor they harbor their babies in their mouth. And they also are sometimes found harboring rocks because of the habit of having a mouth cavity that this harbors babies. And coins even in their mouths. Like this is a very realistic situation. Anyway, why does he go to a fish for his tax money? Next question, Joel Crumbly says, do you have a simple way to share the gospel? How can we know what to say to be obedient and share the gospel effectively without missing any of the essentials? Okay, well, let me give you a, a quick off the top of my head formula I'm making up right now. Um, <laughs> and consider this something to think about, okay? Better than you just getting answers from me is you considering the things and the topics and working through it on your own as well. So my thought is this, there are essential elements of the gospel. And then you have the issue of who you're talking to and whether those make sense. So the essential elements are repent and believe. Okay. I, I think, I think I'm going to put repent as essential because it's part of belief is just turning in your attitude towards sin, right? I'm not saying you, you make your life perfect. That's not what I'm saying, but your attitude towards sin turns and becomes your attitude towards God of belief and faith in Christ. But do you know that you have to turn from sin, that sin is the problem? Well, if they don't know this, you'll have to explain it. So someone who's who's arrogant, who feels self-righteous, they're going to need to be, you're going to need to tell them more about repentance. But let's say that they come to you and they're like, man, I've messed up so much. I don't see how God could, could accept me, could forgive me. You don't need to talk to them as much about that, right? So you're focused more on belief. And you then you have to ask, do they know what believe means? Does it just mean believe there's a God? No, I mean, believe Jesus, right? He died on the cross for you. He rose from the dead bodily. Those are the two key elements of the gospel. So your question is, when I say repent and believe, do they understand they're turning from uh, rebellion against God that they have sin issues and they're putting their trust in Jesus who died and rose for them? And if they understand those things, then all he needs two words. If they don't understand those things, then I have to explain more. So it depends on your audience, how much you have to explain. There's my, uh, my formula. Yeah. Repent and believe two words. Now you get this in the gospels. All the gospels start with the same thing, the preaching of the gospel and people being told to turn from sin and turn to believe. And then that belief is directed at Jesus. Um, there's my my short answer for you. You you know, there's lots of verses we can go to. We can go down the Romans road. We can look at John 3, 16 and 17 and 18 um, and all that. Uh, Cassandra Cavalli says, my province has new COVID mandates that my pastor is implementing. Reduced attendance, vaccine passport checks and masks, even when singing. I think this is unbiblical. What can I do? I don't know, Cassandra. I I I think okay. You guys might think that I'm 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 throwing something out here that that you think is secondary or unimportant, but to me this is actually really important. <clears throat> when it comes to these issues, COVID, uh, masks, and and the and and the 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 heat of this discussion concerns me greatly. I think that people are not everybody, maybe not you who's listening. But in general, people are, their backs are up against the wall on these issues. And 
um, I I think that I'm concerned about the division that that exists in that and how how harshly like here's me telling you that the extent of the atonement is not the gospel issue that determines but there are some people who are going to like they're going to leave your church and disfellowship the entire congregation because of these these mandates these rules and there's others who will leave another church because they won't do the mandates and they'll go to yours and they're disfellowshipping a whole group of people like cutting them out of their lives as christians who are they connect with because of masks and vaccines and i'm like why is this that important okay maybe 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 i'm missing something why am but why am i dividing from believers on these issues like if i go to a church that requires you know masks and stuff i'm gonna wear them if they don't then i'm probably not because i'd rather not do it right and if i'm in a community why i went i'm in california so everywhere i go i have to have a mask on if you go indoors you got a mask on and i'm like fine and if personally if i go to texas where i went to the ets conference in texas and nobody there's wearing masks and i'm like cool i don't wear a mask <laughs> and uh, and somebody are going to get upset with me some of you are going to be like i'm unsubscribing from mike because he didn't wear a mask when he was in texas and i'm like well you're just being a punk like i can't control this but i'm not going to be part of it I will not be part of dividing and ripping apart the body of Christ by taking all these issues and elevating them to the highest status. At the same time, that being said, I fully understand there's real concerns about government overreach, about governments being oppressive when it comes to these issues. And in that sense, um, I understand why someone wants to push back, why somebody might want to have what they, they consider to be uh, a, a principled rejection of, of authority. And I'm not telling them they're all wrong, but I am just saying, I'm not going to tell everyone what side they should be on because some of these issues are a little beyond me. I'm just going to say, oh man, can we be the body of Christ even in the midst of disagreement on these topics? So I'll read your question again because I, I feel like I'm not giving you a, a great answer. I'm giving you the best I can here, Cassandra. But you said your province has new COVID mandates that your pastor is implementing, reduced attendance, vaccine passport checks, and masks even while singing. I think it's unbiblical. I don't see any reason why masks while singing is unbiblical. I don't see any reason why it's unbiblical to show someone that you've had a vaccine. Um, I do think that if, if I think it's a mistake for a church not to do something to minister to those who cannot or will not get a vaccine. I think it's a mistake to find, to not find some way of ministering to them. And that is very, that that's sad. Can you, can they, anyway i don't know maybe man this stuff is just such a pain um it's unfortunate so yeah i mean if i was making decisions for a church i don't know if i would actually do a vaccine check not because i think people shouldn't get them but because i don't want it to become this point where the church is disfellowshipping you you don't get the vaccine you can't come in um anyways you guys listen if you disagree with me on this please feel free make a comment about it make a video about it post it below i'm not going to block your comments for doing that um, maybe I'm wrong on some issues here. My main concern is the division that is that, that is rising and the, the vitriol that the world has enters the church on these issues and we need to have a higher calling than that. Um, anonymous question says, I am 23 years old. Six years ago, my attraction to women just disappeared. This messed with my head a lot and also because of physical problems, I can't approach girls in order to find a wife. Can you please advise me? Um... Uh, I, I wish I could give you better, better input. I, I would need to sit with you for like hours and just listen to your story and your life. <clears throat> and that's my best advice to you is, is find a counselor who can sit with you for a long period of time and you can just share all the stuff with them and really listen. Um, and I would just say, go to like a, your local church leadership, but that might not be the best thing because you're dealing with really specific kind of struggles. So you might look out to, um, somebody who maybe if there's a Christian who's written a book or done podcasts, who has dealt with some of the stuff you're dealing with, that would be the person to perhaps reach out to and look for resources on the, uh, attraction to women disappeared. The question is why, um, can't approach girls in order to find a wife. The question is, is, is why, um, what physical problems, what are they? I just can't, I can't just throw out advice that you might take that would mess up your life <laughs> because I don't really know your situation. So anonymous question. I am truly sorry. Um, please continue to seek for counsel and help from others and be emboldened to reach out to some people and not be embarrassed about your situation. We all have weaknesses and we've all got embarrassing things that we struggle with and we've all got problems and we just need to not be alone in all those things. Don't be alone. Keep reaching out. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't give you better help. 
just curious says in a past video it sounded like mike said david's child dying was collateral damage how is that not punishment for david's sins um okay so i did use the term collateral damage there and um collateral damage doesn't mean it wasn't punishment though it's just that when i say collateral damage what i mean is the punishment isn't the baby's not being punished the 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 the, the death of the child is the collateral damage of the punishment that comes upon David or you you could say punishment maybe maybe there's a better word for it maybe chastening is a better word because punishment is is a word that can refer to discipline from a parent as well as like legal discipline right like going to prison um and so th this could be seen as um God chastening and publicly rejecting David's behavior you see this isn't just about David and his life David's the king of Israel chosen by God and propped up by God David's to be a man after God's own heart, and he abused his position, committed adultery, had an affair. Then when the woman became pregnant, he had the father murdered, who was one of his faithful men, had Uriah killed. And then this is the child that comes from the result of that union. And so as long as this child lives, the existence of the child in the kingdom is like a, an, an, an approval statement on the wickedness of the king, which God was trying to chastise and correct. And so... Um, yeah, it's, 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 all this needs to be taken in context of the fact that God alone has the right to just judicially say, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I make alive and I kill. He has the right to do that. I don't. Okay. So there's no justification for humans doing things. Um, second, the fate of the child is to be with the Lord. And so while you could kill somebody, you can't take them into God's presence as the, the way that God can. So these are other things we need to we need to keep in mind. But I think that what we see in Scripture is that God is a more of a judge than we want Him to be. Just to be completely honest, He's more of a judge than we want Him to be, and it's important that we see this in Scripture. God's going to judge the world, and He's going to punish and deal with sin. And sometimes He does it on a national level, where the the person who that each individual who suffers isn't necessarily guilty. But it's part of his overall like cosmic justice being demonstrated to the world, to the angels, to other people, and to be recorded for us to learn from. And I think that God has a right to do this. And for anyone out there, you're tempted, and this is so prevalent in our culture, you're tempted to think, no, I don't think it's right that God did that. It's like, I think that you're philosophically insane to challenge God, the judge of the universe, and look at him and say, you didn't do the right thing there, God. I, with my knowledge, am able to say that was wrong. I don't think you understand holiness. I don't think I do either. None of us understands how holy holiness is because we're all like dirty people who think we're clean, right? We, we, we look at our lives and we think, oh, I had a pretty good day. I did pretty good. But we, we, we never for one minute have been totally holy in our behaviors and our actions and thoughts. And so when we look at God and we try to evaluate whether he's being holy, we're, our, our perspective is tainted. So for those who are tempted to go down that road, I think it's totally fair for you to say, I don't understand why God did, why God did that. I can't comprehend why God did that. That's fine. You can do that all day long. I think you then need to follow it up with, but God is holy and I trust him and I'm just going to sit with it and I won't know and one day I'll find out and I'll understand. There's a, a, a future for us, Revelation 19 talks about it, where God is judging and punishing and the saints in heaven are, are saying hallelujah for God, for God judging. Now, in our culture today, we tend to think that that's wrong, right? Because um, that's just the way we're wired. We, we think that's wrong. And I think that it's the same way that prisoners think that prisons are messed up, right? Because they're the prisoners. Right? So we tend to think God's judgment has a problem with it. But in Revelation, there's a new perspective we have in the presence of God, in his holiness, that causes us to see his judgments as good, where before we didn't understand them. And we see this as well in the Old Testament, right? When Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, he stands before God. He says, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, right? And what does he do? He says, woe is me, for I am a, a man of unclean lips, and I, I dwell amongst, amongst a people with unclean lips. I am not worthy to speak in God's presence. Woe is me. I, I've seen how holy he is, and now I realize how messed up I am. Meaning that if Isaiah had been asked to evaluate God's judgment before he saw God, he may, have, he may have thought God was being too harsh. After seeing God, he went, whoa, I didn't realize how messed up I am. Job, same thing. He saw God and was like, whoa, I repent in dust and ashes. I'm a fool. The revelation of God's holiness will immediately fix our misunderstandings about when God brings judgment, death, punishment, and we will see it the way it really is. 
And those who shook, shook their fist at God will find out that they were just being fools. Number 18, JJ Ruiz says, Ruiz uh, says, why did the promise for honoring your parents change from Old Testament in the land I will give you versus the new living long on the earth? Um, let's, so you, you quote two verses, Ephesians 6, 2. We'll go there first. This is the New Testament one. And okay. Um, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Um, so this is from Exodus twenty twelve, which is the other verse that you quoted. Let's read it now. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. But you're, you must have been reading a translation that in um, Ephesians had the phrase live, living long on the earth. But usually when scripture talks about earth, it just means land. It doesn't mean planet, right? In, in a modern English, the word earth means planet and the word land means some portion of land. But in biblical terminology, earth just usually, more often than not, not in every possible case, more often than not, though, it just means land as opposed to ocean, right? It's not thinking about, it's not even thinking about the shape and the size and all this. It's just land as opposed to water. <laughs> like that's what earth is. Earth is, and we've even done this in recent English, you know, in the past, like you can have a handful of earth. Nobody thinks you have the whole planet, right? So this is just, you know, with, with our continual speech and discussions about space and about astronomy and things like that. We've started using the term earth. It seems in normal English, my perspective on this is we've started using it really more often to refer to the planet and we refer to land or continent or nation or other terms for what the Bible just says earth. So you have some translation that says in Ephesians six twenty earth, and maybe that has made you think that this is like, um, here we go. Ephesians 6, 2, sorry, Ephesians 6, 2 in, um, the NASB here, it says on the earth, right? Um, and that what I'm suggesting is earth and land here are synonymous terms. So I think that hopefully answers that question for you. These are just synonymous terms. Um, the, the point Paul is making is, Hey, the honor your father and mother commandment was the first of the commandments that came with a special promise about it elongating your life. Right. And that there's an application to that as well today that we should we should pay attention to. You listen to your parents and you'll live longer. <laughs> it's very true in whatever whatever land you're in. Um, number 19, Kaylee Whitten. Here we go. 19. Kaylee Whitten says, how do we protect ourselves from postmodernist thinking such as truth is subjective when discussing matters of different convictions? Example, Christians disagreeing over matters such as cursing. Yeah. Um, what we have to recognize is that there is. Um, a difference between saying truth is subjective and saying those are my convictions because um, there's two ways I'm trying to think of how to explain this there's two ways that I in my mind that I understand how convictions relate to the idea of truth being subjective or objective one of them is um, hey this this behavior is objectively okay objectively okay, but my convictions have me feeling as though I shouldn't do it, so I won't do it. An example of this is Romans, where he talks about, um, you know, how some people eat meat and other people, they don't eat any meat. As long as they do it under the Lord, that's okay. But Paul also lays out that eating meat is okay, that anything is is acceptable. It's it's sanctified by prayer and the word, right? So you, you, you just say, oh, I, I thank you God for this food. You know, you've provided all things. I'm not under the law. I can eat this pork. That's fine. But someone else says, yeah, you can, but I just feel convicted about it, so I won't. So we can, we should agree, objectively, eating the pork is not wrong, but that person has a um, conviction that we're going to honor, and they should honor before God. That doesn't make pork wrong objectively. It makes it difficult for them to eat it because through their conviction, there's a problem. The other thing would be these gray areas. Um, and, and cussing, it, it feels like it's increasingly... Um, I, I feel like it's pretty clear. Okay. But here's where it becomes gray. So scripture tells us not to use foul language. Like this is, this is a policy for us to have as Christians. Do not use foul language, filthy language, filthy talk, that kind of thing. And this would of course apply beyond cussing, but I think it applies to cussing as well. C curse words, that kind of thing. But defining all of the curse words, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not so easy. And there are some words where you're like, okay, 
can, can you say that word? Is that word wrong? And here we're not suggesting there is no subjective truth. We're suggesting the subjective, the, ob, excuse me, we are not saying there's no objective truth about this word in this environment being right or wrong. We're just saying that it's sometimes hard to tell whether it's right or wrong, right? Because some, sometimes you have like real bad words, then you have like the alternate words, right? Like, can you say, darn it? Or am I, am I, is it wrong that I said, darn it? Is that wrong? I just said it right now, you know? Well, I think there's no problem there, but there are some words where you go, I don't know. This seems like it's a little questionable. And then society changes and words shift meanings over time. And a word that may have been really bad before might be moving in its normal usage to sort of like a, a random expression that doesn't really carry as much of a connotation. So here, what I'm looking at is not that there's no objective truth, but that there is a gray area of knowledge. I just, I can't tell for sure how this word in this environment sits as it being a curse word or a, a foul language term. Maybe in this other environment, it's more clearly a foul language term. Maybe in this one, it, the same term being used in a different culture feels different. So I give people space. Here's where I say, well, let follow your convictions, guys. Seek to honor the Lord in what you do. And I'm, I'm not going to overly judge situations that are di difficult for me to understand. So again, we're not saying there's no objective truth there. We're saying that the truth is difficult to determine. And so you leave it to people's conscience because you're not going to make a rule where you just don't know exactly what the rule is supposed to be. I hope that answers your question, Kaylee. <laughs> All right, Ken Copper. Here's our last question for today. It says, how do we know God's purpose for our lives as in a career? Um, so what if you have options, <laughs> Ken. What if there's, there might be an assumption that there's one particular career you're supposed to pursue. And if you don't pursue that, you've, you've failed God's plan in that regard. But why do we think this? What if you have options? What if you have options of multiple careers you could pursue, different types of things you could do. And the rule is just do whatever you do in the name of the Lord, do it unto the Lord. That's my impression. And so instead of it being what career is, is God telling me to do, I think you look at your options, you look at your giftings, right? So options are like, can you go to school? Do you, do you know people in this job environment and that en environment? Is this a reachable task, a reachable career for you? Um, skills and giftings are like, but am I good at that? Am I skilled in this area? Am I, am I naturally inclined towards being able to do that, right? Um, and, and if the answers are yes, then that's a great option for you. The only issue is do it under the Lord. Do it with integrity. Do it without compromise. Every, every career has layers of like regular compromise where everybody's like car salesmen. Like there's so many, there's so much lies and deception. <laughs> this is, I'm on cars still because I was shopping for cars for a bit there. There's so much lies and deception amongst car salesmen that you, you, you start to feel like, oh, this is just how it's done, but not for you, Christian, you rise to the standard of Jesus and you do it unto the Lord entirely. So Ken, I think you have plenty of options here. I think you should look at your giftings, look at your opportunities, and you should seek to honor and glorify God, uh, by pursuing a career that, that looks like a good choice there. Now, all that being said, you always clothe everything in prayer. Lord, uh, uh, here's, here's what looks good to me. Here's what seems good, but please show me if there's anything specific you'd rather me do. Please direct and guide me and open doors and close doors and all this and make me aware if this is not the path you have for me, if you have some other agenda or plan. I'm just going to seek to honor you the best I can. This looks like a good path. I'm praying that you correct and guide and direct me in it. I think that's the right thing to do. Walking in wisdom, walking uh, in, in service to your king, to seek, to serve, to glorify God in whatever job you got. That seems like the good way to do it. Um, I, I hope that this is very helpful for you, Ken. You got options. You got options. I even think in marriage, you know, unless God tells you it's got to be that girl or that guy, I think we have options. It's not, is this the one? It's like, is this a one? Is this a good choice? Is this a godly choice? Is this a, a choice that, that would uh, give me opportunity to honor Christ in this, in this relationship? All those kinds of questions. So thank you guys for joining me. Um, I will be with you next Friday. That's the next, uh, actually I had a couple things planned. Let me just check real quick so I can tell you what we got coming up for those that are interested in what's coming. Um, yeah, next Friday is the next time I plan on streaming and that's the 17th. But then on the 20th, I'm gonna have Jay Warner Wallace. That's the guy that wrote Cold Case Christianity. He's got a new book out. We're gonna be talking about some of those things. That's gonna be on Monday the 20th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. I'll put up a link on the channel a few days before. And other than that, thank you guys for joining. God bless you. Um, may he use us as we meet with and talk to our family and relatives. May we show them love and grace and kindness. 
and be lights for Christ this year. Take care. Don't get too many Christmas songs stuck in your head. <laughs> They've all been stuck in my head recently.